is the Healthcare Consultants Podcast, brought to you by the Chicago Health Law and Professional Licensing Firm of Michael V. Fabia and Associates. This is your host, Nick Augustine, and today our guest is Bruce Johnstone from Apex Design Build. Bruce is going to tell us all about the process of designing and building high-quality medical facilities for medical, dental, veterinary, and other health care practices. Let's say hello to Bruce Johnstone. Hello, Nick. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited for this conversation. All right. Well, Bruce, um, I look forward to hearing a little bit about what you all do at Apex Design Build and how it can tie in with all of our healthcare consultants, podcast listeners, and those out there who are connected through Mike Favia and his firm. Uh, we just want to bring people the right opportunities to do exactly what they need to build the best practice. So moving forward, let's just talk a little bit about Apex Design Build, its history in architecture and design. Yeah, you bet. Uh, so I'll jump right in. Apex is a uh, family-owned design and construction firm, so uh, we work solely in the private healthcare market. Uh, discerning healthcare professionals, practice owners specifically, that's who we, that's who we work with. Um, we're known for our ability to combine our focused healthcare expertise with a comprehensive sort of one-stop shop, one -stop shop uh, solution for design, architecture, and construction. And uh, the purpose to ultimately provide a best-in-class experience for every, every client that we partner with. And what that really means for our clients is they get the peace of mind to concentrate on treating their patients while we look after their project. That's our aim. Uh, so by the by bringing that one-stop shop approach to design, architecture, and construction, it's a seamless process from front to back. Um, that's what we're all about. Sounds good. So I like the idea of them not having to worry about every detail in the process and focus on their practices because healthcare practices are very busy. And, you know, in all times, pandemic or not, there are all sorts of people with needs, and those needs have to be met. And I understand that the different facilities that they need are very different depending on different types of practices. Um, even within, let's say, chiropractors, one chiropractic office is not what the same as the next one is. And depending on where you're located, there may be all sorts of different things that go into figuring those out. So when you talk about healthcare expertise, how mm -hmm. did Apex Design Build really focus on that? When did that happen, and what did that look like? Carving sure. that out yeah, of the question. for everyone else. Yeah. So, so it really began with the uh, sort of at the inception of the company with uh, my great grandfather starting the firm as an architect. So we're like I said, family-owned, we're four generations, and we began as an architectural firm. And uh, that's where the healthcare sort of uh, seed was planted in the firm, but it was more with large health systems. That's, that's primarily where the healthcare experience uh, started. So as an architectural firm, we worked on large hospital projects. Um, that evolved into like a, uh, uh, you know, construction company when second and third generation took over and continued that theme into the health systems of being contractors and cabinet makers for, for hospitals. Um, and then it sort of came full circle, uh, you know, into a design architecture and construction firm once the fourth generation, myself and my brothers came into the business. Um, but somewhere along the way there, and I can break it down, we sort of got into more private health care rather than health systems, large hospitals. Um, and that was back in the, in the late 80s when that really started. And the reason for that switch was, uh, you know, because there was a lot more, um, you might say, practice ownership became a lot more prevalent uh, for a period of time there, and the relationships that we had built in the hospital sort of just transferred over into private practice. Um, so the, the, the expertise in healthcare has always been with the firm, really, since the beginning. Uh, and it's not to say that there haven't been other commercial projects along the way and other um, industry sectors, but healthcare has always been a common theme uh, with Apex. 
And I think just as the organization has grown and evolved across four generations, so has our uh, service offering to be as robust as it is today. Um, but the expertise has been accrued over uh, four generations of being in business. So um, with that, you touched on the fact that, look, every, every practice is different, every specialty is unique, um, requirements for each practice is unique. But the fact that we have four generations of expertise sort of uh, to carry forward, it allows us to approach each project with a level of understanding and depth of knowledge that translates into a much easier project for or experience for um, the end users, the, the clients of ours. Now I can also under I can guess that when someone is looking at a build out for a certain practice, the the things that we're going through right now with spacing things apart. Um, you know, people putting up just general, um, like the plastic shields and all that. I think that some of those might be mm -hmm. somewhat incorporated, right, into spaces. People thinking forward about, you know, general health and general cleanliness and, um, and all these things. That just being one example, I'm wondering how over time – as generations and decades go on, how things really change and what people need in their offices. I mean, I'm, maybe it's a function of the type of machinery and tools they're using, some of that you know, technology changing. Um, I can sure. imagine that things could be outdated at some point. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Yeah, I mean, things have changed the course, over the course of time, and one of the biggest drivers for that um, has been technology and what's been brought into healthcare practices and the way, uh, you know, physicians practice through the utilization of technology. And so that has an impact on design, has an impact on workflow, sort of the, um, the functional uh, side of the practice where we look at adjacencies and what functions need to be adjacent to what to make an efficient workflow through a practice. Um, but that has certainly impacted, uh, impacted how practices operate. Um, the p pandemic is a is a great example of something that really nobody uh, could accurately predict, uh, you know, a year ago, let it, let alone five years ago and ten years ago when when we were building practices and designing them and trying to look into the future. It's hard to predict certain things, but we always say, hey, it's how it's how obstacles are, are handled when they present themselves. So we try to predict and. Or, you know, foresee in the future as best we can to be sure that we're designing and building practices for the long, you know, long term. We want long longevity out of these practices. Obviously, it's a costly endeavor. Um, there's only so much that we can uh, that's in our <laughs> control to help our clients advise based on past experience and where we see the future going as far as how practices should be set up. Um, but at least the expertise that we do have can be applied in a way to try to preemptively uh, future-proof, if you will, the practice. Um, you know, the, the layout, the design, the, the workflow is super important. Uh, when a pandemic and something like that comes along and completely changes how things are done in the practice, then it's how we, uh, what, you know, what can we implement now to immediately get practices, you know, running as efficiently as possible. But obviously that now uh, enlightens how we design practices going forward. Um, but yeah, there's things that just you know that come up, and you you add them to uh, to the list of of things to consider, and and uh, chalk it up as experience to learn from and grow by. Well, there you go. Well, when I, when you talk about efficiency and workflow, can you give some examples? Um, if I let's say I'm a a medical practitioner, um, what types of things sure. would I be thinking about? When I can th think about workflow, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Yeah, well, think about, um, think about patients and staff and doctors, uh, everyone in the, in the space, if you will, in the practice, in the facility. Uh, they're there for a reason. They, they have a certain role. Um, so you think about from the front to the back of the facility, um, what – what is the start with the patient experience? What is the patient's work, you know, sort of flow in and out of the in the, in and out of the practice as they come for an, an appointment, a visit, a treatment of of whatever 
um, nature. And all the touch points along the way, from check-in to you know, triage if there is, to an exam or treatment room, to perhaps a procedure, an OR, whatever it might be, and then right back on out of the, out of the practice. Um, so you think about that. You think about then the staff and what are their responsibilities through the course of the day, uh, all the traffic patterns, if you will, throughout the practice. Um, and then how they all need to correlate to be as efficient as possible. So to give you a, a really obvious example, um, you know, let's say a, uh, in a dental practice, for example, let's use, you know, a certain practice type as an example. So dental practice has a central sterilization area uh, in relation to all the operatories of the treatment rooms. And the amount of traffic between operatories and sterilization through the course of the day um, for the, uh, you know, the, the hygienist and the uh, dental assistant is very high. There's a lot of back and forth between those two functions in the, in the course of the day. Whereas the doctor, there's a lot of, you know, movement between perhaps consult to operatories uh, less obviously in and out of lab and stereo through the course of the day. For a patient, they're starting from the front of the practice, they're checking in, and depending on what type of dental care they're receiving, they go to a certain operatory and they come back out through checkout. Well, we study all those, all those traffic patterns, and, you know, depending on the type of practice, if it's a dermatologist or a veterinary hospital or whatever it is, and we work to define the most effective uh, set up of a, of a practice to make that workflow, make that traffic pattern um, as efficient as we can with as, as little of bottlenecks as possible. Um, on the flip side, if you were to have a sterilization center at the far end of the facility and a whole bunch of you know, treatment uh, rooms on the other end, obviously a very inefficient. I mean, that's, a, that's an obvious example just to help sort of give you the visual yeah and it, you know it makes so, so so much sense to me i think we've all been to an office where we had a positive or negative reaction to it in probably about 30 seconds from the time you sit down are the chairs comfortable do they have that highlights magazine i really want to read as a kid you know i don't know what they have now but yeah is, the yeah. T is there a tv on is there a tv that yeah. you know blaring some obnoxious program or is it something pleasant is there art on you know when i see a lot of this like the dental place that i go to they have i mean they have the 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 border with the background with their logos and the cool shades and you can take a picture and i mean they make they make the they try to make it a fun experience even though you're mm -hmm. at the dentist mm -hmm. and no one really loves to go to the dentist but you know they give you the beats headphones and you can watch tv and whatever and it's all very mm -hmm. it's like you're not even there they all it's very kind of seamless and compare that to the process where someone may be going through and like you said it's a an older building or something that wasn't designed for that dentist and there's long hallways and noise and i mean just the background noise thinking how do you how do you address the noise of other people getting their teeth drilled when you're there and <laughs> i mean that these are serious things to think about yeah. Yeah, so yeah. it's important, yeah, I believe, right. for someone who wants to, especially now that dentists are con consolidating and you know, the dental practice buying and selling is something that's going on, and people are there's a lot of people stepping into that, you know, as an investor who are saying, okay, let's make sure that these are the happiest places possible because that's going to really create good for you know return business and loyal customer base. For sure. Yeah, you mentioned first impressions. Um, you know, we like to emphasize the impact of the appearance and aesthetic of a, of a practice, how that impacts new patient acquisition. Um, there's, a real, there's a real formula there. It's, it's actually a thing. Uh, first impressions do mean everything. Typically, a patient is not informed enough to know whether they're getting best, you know, best in class treatment by the provider purely based on the care that they're given. Instead, they like to judge first on what do they hear, what do they see, what do they smell, what, what does it feel like when they go there? And that's the first judgment. The second judgment is, okay, what happened when I was actually in the treatment room or, or what was the, the, the post-treatment you know, post care? That, then that's kind of the, 
the second and third impressions, if you will. Um, so there's a ton of emphasis for us on that balance of aesthetically uh, appropriate for the target patient base and functional. So the, the practice can be a, a machine. It can, it can work seamlessly, effectively through the course of a day. Um, and both are equally as important because obviously the function side of it uh, results in, in uh, the practice's ability to generate you know, revenue, uh, see as many patients as they can without reducing the quality of care in a given day. Um, and the aesthetic side is for that new patient acquisition and patient retention for that matter, keep them coming back. So yeah, there's Absolutely. definitely a balancing act there. When you talked about workflow, one of the things I'm glad you talked about was the productivity <laughs> of your employees and staff because happy workers make for happy, you know, they're better to the patients, they're better, it's a better experience, everyone's happy. And I, and I, it's as someone who's been, a, I can't think anything more uncomfortable than being somewhere where the employees somewhere are arguing or people are being, you can tell when the vibe's just off. And That's right. there is a lot to, there's a lot with, uh, I mean, I, one of my friends who was doing a build out of a law firm was talking about how much went into the choice of colors and seating and what and whatever just to keep people mm -hmm. happy. And there's so much that goes mm -hmm. into that where, um, you know, the colors that, that we the pick and the textures and everything really, that stuff matters, mm -hmm. even though people try to shrug it off and say, you know, it doesn't, but it really does. It sure does, yeah. Testament to that, we had a client um, who – was 30 years in practice and had to relocate, was forced to, um, because of the building that he was in was being you know, acquired by a different owner and they were making changes, whatever. He was forced out of the building, had to move. Uh, and when we relocated the practice, we added one more treatment room than what he had had for 30 years. Um, and that room was mostly just for overflow. You know, He was trying to future-proof his practice. Um, but apart from that, there wasn't more space added from a clinical standpoint. There was more space added from a support function standpoint, and there was more space for, you know, for, a, uh, for movement, to, you know, wider hallways, um, you know, make, make the space easier to, to move through. So he relocated three months after relocating um, and seeing patients in a new space. Uh, you know, we do our check-in, how's it going? So you wouldn't believe it, uh, my billings this month are 30% higher than the best Ever preceding uh, month in my 30 years of practice, and we said, really, well, what, what, what's the reason? He said, well, I haven't increased hours, uh, you know, opening hours. I haven't increased uh, staff. Um, he said, the only thing I can attribute it to is my staff are walking lighter, walking faster. They're proud to be there. They're working so well together, and all of that is helping us see more patients in a, in a day combined with how, uh, how many patients are going home and raving about my new practice and sending their friends and family to come see me. He's like, combine the two things, and that's all I can put it down to. <laughs> so it does, it does make – there, there truly is a difference uh, that can be made by the environment that everyone's working in. And it's in that really, really ties into a, the brand of the practice. And, you know, exactly. when you take those, you know, take the, especially when you take the colors and the logos and all that, and you keep a continual, you know, process of doing that, um, you know, people might see that and they just, they, people get that instant. I like it or I don't like it. You know, when people go to a website, they make their thoughts and judgments about that website in a matter of seconds. They either know, do they like, and it can be literally just the fonts and the colors and how things are presented, whether it's something that's stressful or whether it's not. And it's, it's, it's like a background in psychology that goes into a lot of these things, but it makes so much sense why the happier employees are feeling that they're at a place that's high class and very well worth it. Um, I want to ask you a little bit, Bruce, about what you expect with some of the changes that have been going on, particularly I have friends in the Chicago area talking to me about 
certain businesses that let go of their spaces because they realized most of their employees could do work from home. Um, different with medical, dental, and healthcare facilities where you need everyone there in a space. I, mm-hmm. I feel like there are going to be a lot of spaces that are going to be opened up in a lot of buildings where the rents may be more affordable coming years, but you're going to possibly be going into something that, again, was a law firm or was some sort of other office that's now being converted. So for someone who's never built a place out before, how does that work? Do you find the space yeah. that is, it has to be demoed first? And is it what we think of when we watch HGTV programming when they do you know, house <laughs> flips and renovations? Yeah. No, it's a good question. Uh, see, the, the real estate market is obviously taking a, a, a lot of bumps in the road uh, ahead that, that's hard to predict uh, with clarity. Now, what we're seeing, though, uh, with work from home impacts, of course, uh, corporate office, commercial space heavily. Um, there's been, though, a migration of healthcare into retail space. Uh, or, or medtail, or, or there's all sorts of terms that have been applied to it. But retail space, because it is more accessible, more visible, easier for patients to come and go than in uh, you know the um, the business, the uh, the corporate office sort of feel of a of a mm-hmm. healthcare space is is less desirable in, in today's sort of market. It seems, and so. For healthcare specifically, how the cost of real estate or the um, you know lease expense is going to uh, play out in the foreseeable future um, is in a way hard to predict because yes, there have been vacancies and there will continue to be in retail, um, but in, in a way, my opinion is there's going to be less uh, of that than there is in the in the corporate and commercial office space. And so how it directly applies to or, or has an impact to the healthcare market, um, you know, I'm not certain that there will be a significant change. Uh, you know, landlords are going to go through, a, I'm sure, a whole, uh, you know, a whole bunch of, of uh, mergers and acquisitions, and there's going to be a lot of change uh, structurally as a result of all this, because they're going to have to start to de-risk some of their assets that aren't performing well, and those types of properties, no doubt, will be devalued um, to a to a large degree. But again, I'm, I'm just not certain that it's going to have a massive impact to our type of clientele who are uh, practice owners and primarily either in a built-to-suit freestanding facility or in a retail type of setting. That's the, that's the majority anyway. Um, you know, if practices are looking to be in a, uh, in a high rise downtown, yes, there, there probably is going to be uh, some change, at least in base rent. Now we look at leases though from multiple ways because there's a base rent expense but then there's a landlord, typically there's landlord contributions to a build out. Healthcare is expensive to build out. Uh, landlords typically contribute a lot of money towards it because there's long-term leases. I would wonder if we're gonna to continue to see uh, the strong contributions that we have seen historically from landlords in those types of buildings, because if they have high vacancies, um, it's more unlikely that they'll be offering such large concessions on their leases. So I kind of think there's a bit of a give and take in those, uh, in the terms of those leases, if you can see where I'm going with this. Yes, you might have a lower rent, but I think you're also going to have a lower TI contribution from the landlord. At the end of the day, your cost of that lease getting into the space, including the build-out expense, I'm not certain that we're going to see um, a positive uh, improvement or, or you know, reduction, if you will, in, in those costs. Mm-hmm. Well, it should be interesting to watch. Meanwhile, it will be. <laughs> tell us, <laughs> everyone's hey, twenty twenty one's coming. You know, everyone's sort of holding on and saying, you know what, just keep your nose to the grindstone, keep working. We'll see what happens. That's but it. in the meantime, That's it. for those who are interested in again the process of getting this done, and you talked about the value of 
apex design build, handling everything from the soup to the nuts while people continue to work their practices and know that everything is being handled well. Tell us about the apex continuum, the proprietary process there used at apex design build, you know, routed in healthcare expertise. So what is the apex continuum? Sure. Yeah, we've um, we've assigned that uh, label, if you will, to our proprietary process that we've developed over the course of time, uh, and it really is the idea that that we're able to, you know, see a client from the very beginning to the very end, uh, and it creates uh, enormous accountability. Um, it creates a lot more control over time and money through the course of the project with the client, which is which is a powerful thing um, as compared to the traditional model uh, or the design bid build process where an architect is retained, goes out to bid to contractors, and then the client is navigating that relationship between the architect and the contractor and trying to deal with all the, the typical fallout, communication, budget overruns, time overruns. So the apex continuum is, uh, you know, a, a as far as we're concerned, the solution to a broken system that's widely used in the architecture, you know, design construction industry. Uh, and so, you know, it starts with, at the very beginning, just a, a deep dive into all the requirements of the, of the given uh, doctor, practice, you know, uh, practice owner. What are all the requirements of the practice? Document everything in, in a ton of detail. Um, and, at that same stage, we're also trying to identify what other support you know, system, what other team uh, members need to be added to this uh, cycle to, to make it go fluidly, make it go well for the client. In other words, um, yes, we are, you know, the apex continuum is the design, architecture, and construction process, but we're also embarking on something that requires all sorts of other uh, professionals to surround that uh, endeavor to make it successful. Um, attorney uh, that has healthcare experience, a CPA, uh, financial advisor, uh, lending, healthcare experience, banks that have products specifically geared towards these type of practices, equipment suppliers, IT vendors, you name it, right down the, down the line. We're wanting to help our clients get established in those relationships if they don't already have them to really get a, a, a good handle on this whole endeavor, because it's more than just the design and construction process. There's everything that goes with uh, getting established in a facility. Um, so, you know, that's that's our approach is we're trying to create a holistic uh, sort of all all encompassing uh, effort to lead the the pro lead the the client through the process. Um, again, with that end goal of making the doctor's life easier during this process, typically an overwhelming process. Let's make it as easy as we possibly can because we have this whole wealth of resource, <clears throat> excuse me, wealth of resource with other professionals coupled with what we, uh, you know, with what we deliver in the design and construction realm of things. So that's what the uh, Apex Continuum speaks to. I love it because things are so specialized these days and you would rather, it just makes all the sense not to have the roadblocks that could come along the way when you've got too many different people from too many different entities involved. And instead of having one company who has everyone lined up for all that, it just makes all the sense to me. Um, Bruce, for people who want to learn more about Apex Design Build and get in touch with you and find out what things might look like if they're considering to do something, um, how should they be in touch? Yeah, the best way is through our website, uh, and then you can reach out multiple ways, uh, either email or phone. Uh, once you get to the website, that is apex, A-P-E-X, designbuild.net, apexdesignbuild.net. All right. Well, Bruce, I want to thank you for your time this afternoon and telling us all about the process. I also want to thank our listeners out there who listen to this program and may find it on social media and like and share our information. The program, again, is brought to you by the Chicago Health Law and Professional Licensing Firm of Michael V. Fabia & Associates with offices in Chicago and Rolling Meadows. 
For introductions and referrals to healthcare professionals in the Chicagoland area, you may call Michael V. Fabia and Associates at 312-609-6666. Bruce, I want to thank you again for your time, and I've enjoyed the program. Likewise. Thank you, Nick. All right. Everyone have a great day. Thank you for listening.